in the beginning, right? And I've used that that, uh, that phrase deliberately. Um, anyone here recognize where that comes from? Out of curiosity. In the beginning, the Bible, right? And You'll notice that the background image on this slide is what? For those who have taken any form of medieval history, you should come across one of these at some point. Ali? Map of the world. It's a map of the world. It's a map of Mundi. It's basically what we call a TO map. The T here of the Mediterranean with the O of the ocean. Now, as you can tell, it's not really a map that you would recognize, and nor is it supposed to be. You have up in the north here Asia, Europe, and Africa. But what's interesting about this map isn't whether or not it's a geographically correct map, because it isn't, but what else, but what it does tell us. There's actually a lot of information on this map. And one of the things that is very important to us in this lecture is the fact that the words underneath the continents. So you have Asia, Europe, and Africa. And underneath them, you have three other names. Shem, Japheth, so Shem in the north, Japheth, and Ham. And again, if anyone's familiar with their Old Testament, particularly Genesis, are, what, by, what sort of significance do those names have? Kate? They're supposed to be Noah's kids, but they're also the people that are like the fathers of everybody in the world. Kind of That's exactly correct. Shem, Japheth, and Ham, according to Genesis, are the three sons of Noah that after the flood, out they come with their wives, and they found, pretty much, and populate all three continents. So Shem is seen as the founder of Asia, Japheth as Europe, and Ham as Africa. How is that important? Well, one of the things that we'll see throughout this lecture and through the readings and through the discussion that we have uh, later tonight is the fact that European chroniclers, historians, were very keen to tie themselves and to plug themselves into this kind of genealogy. Basically, you have European monarchies trying to type, type, uh, plug themselves into an ancient genealogy that went back all the way to Noah, which, of course, goes all the way back to Adam and Eve because a part of a Christian cosmology. So one of the questions that I want to pose this evening is why do the peoples we are looking at in this course create their identity? Why do they do this? I mean, after all, why not just simply say we are the people that we are? Why, why create all of these... So this sort of apparatus around identity. On Tuesday, we saw some of the reasons why, right? Uh, we saw the artifacts that we create as modern people. And I think it's fair to say that many of the same processes that we see today were relevant and are relevant to the Middle Ages and the early modern period. However, I think as you may have seen in the readings, these processes also took on different forms and that not all these identities were self-created but also imposed by later writers. And so I think I made this point on Tuesday as well, that some of the identities are self-created. Yes, I descended from a sea god, but that some of these other identities were in fact imposed by later writers, that these myths were not created by the people themselves, but by people describing these people. In the beginning, I think this is where we need to start, at least in my own mind, where we need to start. And that is, of course, with the Bible. In part because the Bible provided a lot of the material from which later, I'm sorry, from which medieval historians and writers drew upon when tracing their origins. And, as we'll, and we'll come across this idea again, particularly when we look to um, the histories of the Capetian monarchy in the 13th and 14th centuries, very keen on showing themselves how people were connected to biblical genealogies. One of the things about the Bible, again, for those who have read the Bible, one of the things that may strike you about it is that it has an awful lot of genealogies. It has an awful lot of so-and-so begat, so-and-so begat, so-and-so begat, so-and-so begat, so-and-so, until you realize you've lost how many begats there are. Right? The entire Bible is full of these begats. Uh, the New Testament does the exact same thing with the generations of Jesus, right? to show that Jesus was the promised Messiah that goes all the way back to King David and then goes all the way back to, to Moses and back to Adam. And so these genealogies in the biblical text, of course, are about Israelites. They are about um, the Jews and they're about Israelites. But the repeating formula, these are the generations of so-and-so, are part of the Bible's connected thread. And it's that connected thread that European genealogists, European historians, European um, political thinkers all sort of imitated. 
Again and again, the stories focus on threats to the continuity of the tribal family, of the, of, of the Israelite family. Starting with the threat of death uh, to, of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, then to the murderous relations among their children and descendants, and most abundantly, the many threats to the patriarchal families. And again, the, New, the Old Testament is full of these threats of, uh, for example, of famine, of war, of destruction. Genesis, then, focuses on the genealogical tree that culminates in the tribes of Israel and the trouble that this family faces along the way. So, so Genesis itself, as a book, of course, has nothing to do with European history. It's a history, um, in many ways, invented history of, of the Israelites, explaining the 12 tribes of Israel, and, of course, later to explain the origins of the Jews. The fact is, the Bible, of course, has one of the foundational texts of Christianity, becomes an important source text for European monarchies. And one of the things you see in medieval European history is how often kings tie themselves back to Solomon or to Noah, again, to give themselves a sense of prestige, to give themselves a sense of we are part, not only an ancient lineage, but we're part of God's people, we're part of God's lineage. Because after all, the Bible is the word of God, and if we're connected to the Bible, then God approves of us as well. And just to emphasize this, it's not a great picture. Unfortunately, um, it's not my picture, and I can't get, and this is actually one of the best ones I can find. At the Musée, uh, at the Hotel de Cluny in Paris, houses the Museum of Medieval Civilization. That's a fantastic thing. If you ever go to Paris, definitely take a day to go visit the Hotel de Cluny. It's a fantastic piece of 15th century Gothic architecture. But in the museum is this diptych, which is, of course, uh, known as the Sacre de David and Louis XII. I don't know if you can see that clearly enough. Maybe I shut the drapes. Can, anyone, can people see that? Anything you want, is there anything you want to say about that? I mean, on one hand, I mean, obviously it's a painting, it's a piece of art, so obviously. But anything that stands out to you? Kate? Is that supposed to be a guy in the middle of the Yes, okay, so David is here. So this is King David, okay. and this is Louis XII. Um, this is one of the things that you see in the early, uh, late medieval early modern period is a lot of ambient sexuality. Right? The point is the guys look like girls. Um, lots, lots of fantastic hair. Um, although it's not just Louis XIV that made the great ankles, but that's a whole different image. Yeah, mirrors. These are almost mirrors of each other? They are mirrors. So again, it's a diptych. So in other words, this is part of a single piece of art. Mm -hmm. right? So this is a single piece. Um, so yes, yeah, so you, to read it as almost uh, uh, a singular, unique image. So, this is a singular image, so anything else in it, perhaps? Wait, did you have any? Oh, sorry, I thought you had to have Oh, then fantastic. Um, King David, biblically, biblically, is the most fair and righteous king, so the comparison here is that Louis also falls in the name Yeah. Again, look at the iconography. If you look at the way that both kings are presented, obviously David would never look, this is not historically accurate. This is not, not even close to what David would have looked like, and certainly um, not Gothic. As far as I know, there's no Gothic architecture in 6th century BC, Jerusalem. All that kind of cool there was, but there isn't. The fact is, is yes, the point is, there's a direct connection being made. King David, the great king of Israel, God's chosen, Right, after all, God chose David to be king of Israel. Louis XII is a brand new, modern day King David. And so, yes, so when you saw this, when this diptych was presented and was displayed and exposed, you were to read a very, very astute political image, uh, political message. And that message is Louis XII is essentially a brand new, modern day King David, with all the same sort of um, authority and the same sort of privileges. So David, chosen by God and approved by God, same with Louis XII. So again, this idea of connecting European monarchs, medieval, early modern, early modern monarchs with biblical figures. Uh, we see it even in Tudor England when Edward VI was born, or sorry, he came to the throne after the death of his, um, of his, uh, of, of his father. Um, 
He was referred to often as a new Josiah. Again, was a king in, in the Old Testament who was recognized for his righteousness. Again, it is approved by God. Um, and so you see this type of common um, connection between biblical figures and modern European monarchs. I think definitions are really important. And one of the things that we'll be doing in this course, in a way, I will be sort of continuing some of the things that other historians have done, um, is I'm using broad terms. So when I use terms like Franks, or Goths, or Visigoths, or Alans, or Saxons, all these sorts of people that we are going to come across, I am using them, of course, as blanket terms. I'm using them as sort of just a, as an umbrella term. The fact is, and I think we saw this on Tuesday, is that these people, of course, were not simply, um, uh, that, these, that these umbrella terms are not accurate, right? That Saxons and Goths could represent or be incorporated with all kinds of different kinds of people, different nationalities, different ethnicities, uh, all these things. Um, and so when we talk then about Franks, and we talk about Saxons, and we talk about Alans and Huns and all these people, we need to understand that these are just simply blanket terms to, over to um, define large groups of people. And that the idea even of the Franks or the Saxons or the Goths, or the Gauls, themselves are, of course, fictitious. And so how, then, are we to make sense of them? I mean, I could spend the entire two hours just listing out all the different kinds of tribes. That's not good, right? And no one's going to sit through that. So how, then, do we make sense of all these people? So when we read about Franks, I mean, if we recognize them as, as fictional, then how do we make sense of them? Well, one of the first things, I think, is to examine what exactly is meant by national identities. Again, on Tuesday, we examined what national identity meant in a modern context. But what does it mean in a pre-modern context? And this is an important thing, I think, since there were, there were no nations, certainly not the nation states, as we understand them during, um, during this period. In fact, the nation states, of course, don't exist until the late 18th and early 19th centuries. In recent decades, then, Historians attempt to, under, to, uh, attempt to understand the transition from the world of late antiquity with its unitary imperial system to the medieval, to medieval Europe of separate kingdoms has become increasingly concerned with the role of early medieval gents, or gents, I'm never quite sure how to pronounce it. It's where we get the modern word gentile from. Essentially, gents is just Latin for peoples. So it's just a, I guess, a way of impressing your parents when you go home for you know, break and your parents ask you, you know, what have you learned and is my money going to tuition is that you well spent? You say, yes it is because I now know another Latin word. There you go. Your money's well spent. I've got another Latin word in my quiver. There we go. So the role of the peoples with the gentis. And I think one of the things that we need to first grasp, and as historians, as we've looked at this and trying to understand the reality of 6th century Europe, is that while people may have looked for a coherent people, a coherent origin in which they could find and look for ancient privileges to support various claims, the fact is, is that these people, of course, rejected, or sorry, we reject now, the notion of a coherent national and ethnic identity. That again, the idea of Franks isn't a national identity. The Franks are simply that blanket term. Consequently, the gentis, or the peoples, have been increasingly viewed as situational constructs fostered by political ethnicity as a phenomenon of social psychology. In other words, to put that into more feasible terms, basically when we talk about these groups, rather than talk about, it, talk about an ethnicity or a nation, what we're really talking about are military groupings. That we look at, so when we talk about uh, Franks or Goths or Gauls or, or Visigoths, what we're really talking about are largely military formations. That these are groups that come together for military um, purposes to either defend or to attack. So as we turn then our attention to analyzing early medieval uh, peoples, we must be aware of dealing with two intertwined but still separate phenomena. The term in early, med early medieval sources and large social groups whose members to a, to a lesser or greater extent, could have shared, or not at all, a common identity. So again, this idea of where 
do these people mean? Where is their identity? The other thing I think I want to mention, at least on this slide, before we move on, is if these ideas are fluid, if they kept changing, if the idea of a Frank and a Goth and a Gaul kept changing, why then are they fixed? Why bother? One, I think I already said, to make it simple. Right, to, make, to give some sort of coherent understanding as to a complex, fluid situation. But I think there's some other factors as well. I think more important factors than simply keeping things simple. One, the idea of a fixed identity often comes from antique or uh, from antiquity. People like Tacitus, right? For those who, when he wrote Germain, the Germania, he created this idea in the way that Kate mentioned, sometimes we talk about Africans as if they're one group, right? I've been to Africa. Well, it's a big continent. There's lots of Africans and a lot of racial and, and genetic diversity. But people like Tacitus and, and, and ancient writers would talk about people as if in that same sort of, that sort of, same sort of context. The Germans, ignoring all the, the complexity. But the other factor I think that's really have to keep in mind, I think is really important, is the role of creating a fixed identity in the creation and consolidation of the successor states. With the fall of the Roman Empire, as the German, uh, German tribes moved into the boundaries of the western half of the Roman Empire, they created in them successor states, right? The kingdoms that would later become known as France and Spain and England and Italy. The fact is, as those, tr as those tribes created these kingdoms, again, they needed to justify why they were there. Because one of the things that's really important in terms of legitima uh, legitimizing one's political authority is having an ancient origin. If you're something upstart, then anyone can replace you. And then one thing that we'll see in a couple of weeks when we look at the uh, example of the Wars of the Roses and the Tudor dynasty, one of the things that was very important to Henry VII and Henry VIII wasn't just about producing a son because Henry VIII wanted a boy to you know, throw the football with. We wanted a son because the Tudor dynasty was incredibly unstable. Because after all, how did Henry VII come to the throne of England in 1485? He killed Richard III, who was the real king of England. And the point was, Henry VII, in, some, in many quarters, was seen as a usurper. And so one of Henry, Henry VII's first tasks was to show that his claim to the English throne was, in fact, legitimate. And so we see the same sort of thing in the successor states. So in the Frankish kingdoms, in the Austro-Gothic kingdoms, in these kingdoms, you see uh, historians, you see kings, you see political people all trying to show why, that why they were there and why they're the ones ruling as opposed to anyone else. And so they're quite more than happy then to tap into and to solidify the idea of a coherent national or ethnic identity that medieval writers themselves had a theological reading of national origins. So we go back, if we go back to the opening slide, this is a medieval map, right? This is, you know, this is medieval, and yet it says more about medieval than, it says about, than about anything else because the point is a theological reading of how Europe came about. Japheth. Our founding father, Europe, is in fact a biblical, son, a biblical character in the Old Testament. Africa, same thing, Asia. This is where we all come from. So we have then this theological, this medieval writers going back and imposing their understanding onto past events. But it's not just historians that do this. We have, for example, um, I don't have it there. One of the first people to do this, of course, is Herodotus. Um, again, anyone who's taken any, hopefully any early medieval history, who come across Herodotus, because in many ways, European history, uh, or a lot of our understanding of these people, comes from Herodotus. And for Herodotus, one of the things I like about Herodotus, I don't know if everyone's had a chance to read him. Anyone read Herodotus at all? Oh, excellent, a few people. If you haven't, put him on your summer reading list. It's a fantastic read. It's a wonderful, wonderful read. More people should write like him. But one of the things that makes Herodotus a really interesting read is that he's one of the first people to practice a form of ethnography, of trying to understand people's 
on their own terms, rather than saying an us and them. Now, of course, he doesn't do that completely. He's not, you know, he's not free of his own context, in his own time. But he provides a somewhat sort of more nuanced understanding of where uh, of different peoples, as opposed to being, we're Greeks, and so we're great, and everyone sucks. But rather, this is what these people do, this is their culture, these are their traditions, and they have some value in and of themselves. But even Herodotus, with his, with his attempt at ethnography, can't escape completely his own time frame, his own form, uh, his own context. And so he'd write about things like Egypt for the Egyptians. So if you lived in Egypt, you were an Egyptian. Assyrians lived in Assyria. Babylonians lived in Babylon. Right? That these were big, again, comprehensive ethnic uh, ge uh, geographies. In connection to this, the church fathers, uh, people like Augustine, Jerome, Ambrose, Tertullian, um, provided, of course, a more comprehensive Christian genealogy. And this is where we start getting the idea of uh, European peoples and monarchs and um, elites being connected to a biblical genealogy. Right? Because after all, the Bible itself wasn't all that important except to the Jews at first, until Christianity comes along and it becomes an important book to, to Christians as well. And as Christians become dominant within the, within the Roman Empire and as these tribes begin to convert, of course, they now begin to incorporate these ideas. And so people like Ambrose and Milan argued or uh, claimed that um, the Goths themselves were descended from Gog, who was the son of Japheth. So again, we go back to this map, and all of a sudden it's no longer just a map. It's now a genealogy. It's now, in a sense, a basic, simple genealogical table. So Japheth founds Europe, Japheth's son Gog, of Gog and Magog fame for those who are you know, reading, you know, sort of looking for the end of the world. Um, the son of Gog was in fact the founder of the Goths, which is a very interesting thing considering that as far as I know Gog never made it to northern Germany, but you know, who cares. So what we have then is this idea that, the, this, that Ambrose and other church fathers began to tie in these peoples into a Christian cosmology. Make sense? It's actually kind of cool. I find it really, really fascinating. I hope you do as well. Isidore Seville, who's uh, provided probably one of the first real encyclopedias of European history, on which he tried to provide an explanation of uh, an etymology of words. Essentially, what Isidore's big work, his big idea, was to define where each what where each word came from. And like Ambrose, Isidore of Seville uh, argued that in fact um, the Goths also came from Gog. And that's why they're called Goths. That Gog and Goths are very, very similar in terms of their etymology. Of course, it's complete fiction, not even close to true. But it sounds very kind of kind. Of, but it isn't just um, the church fathers, it isn't just bishops and, and, and clerics who are interested in this kind of um, seeking origins of peoples. Uh, Latin writers, Procopius, Jordanius, uh, particularly the first two, also were very interested in trying to find these origins. For Procopius, for example, for him, <coughs> the Vandals had migrated westward uh, from the Sea of Asmoth and his later writing, in his Latin writing contemporary Jordanes, alleged that long before the Trojan War, the Goths had moved to the, uh, the continent from the island of Scandinavia. So you have then all these conflicting origin stories. You have Ambrose and Isidore tapping into a deliberate Christian cosmography, Gog, Noah, all of that. You have Latin writers like Procopius and Jordanes who eschew the idea of a biblical origin, but still provide just as fanciful an origin story as well. So for Jordanes, the Gauls and these Germanic tribes come from Scandinavia, which he thought was an island. Um, Procopius also argues that they come from what we now sort of see as the East Asia, uh, the, the Asian uh, steppes. Where do they really come from? Well, that the actual question, of course, is one that's still being debated. 
the English author uh, Asser, who wrote a history of King Alfred the Great, um, no, actually the life of Alfred the Great, also argued this kind of thing. But what's interesting is that, for example, the Franks, who lived in the French, one of the things you see in the reason, one of the things we'll talk about in, in our seminar and our discussion group, is the fact that they also that they saw themselves as the descendants of Trojans, right? The idea that the Franks come from Trojan stock. But what's interesting is this idea that the, that the Franks are Trojans doesn't appear until at least the seventh century. In other words, it's a late addition to the notion of a Frankish origin story. And so the question is, how ancient were the Franks, or how ancient were the Saxons, how ancient were any of these peoples? The fact is, we don't quite know. It's not quite so simple as simply saying they are an ancient people. In many ways, these people were probably quite recent. And Gregor Tours, again, we'll look at later, later this evening, is one of those people that argue for a much more recent origin of the Franks. Right? That in Great Britain, there is no reference to Trojan origins. So among the people that we call Germanic then, uh, both who, who were themselves alien to such terminology, the Frisians, the Thurgundians, you know, the Saxons, the Bavarians, Burgundians, the Franks, were all present in late antiquity. And they very, uh, and they very definitely had medieval futures. The Franks had even been considered the founders of both the French and German kingdoms. After all, um, one of the things why, even as late as World War I, is a question of who owns that piece of land. Is it French and only German? And this becomes a major question, a major debate, during the, actually right until the 19th century, um, as who founded what nation? Because after all, the Franks are Germanic, that's German, and yet they see themselves as French, not German. It's a huge identity crisis sort of thing, particularly by the time it gets to the 17th century, massive psychological, um, massive psychological trauma trying to understand just what are we? Are we French? Are we German? Um, terrible. For Gregory, not only do the Franks have a more modern origin than other, uh, than we'll see in some other writers, but for Gregory, it's a question of rulership. It's a question of dominance. Because for Gregory, what we have end up seeing is that rather than seeing these people as an ancient people, rather what we see are few families who rise to the top. So people like Clovis uh, and basically his, his, his dynasty, pretty much are the ones that rise to the top and come to dominate the other Frankish tribes. And because they dominate, they're the ones that sort of seeing that becomes that again that umbrella group. Despite the fact that there are all kinds of different kinds of Franks within the Frankish kingdoms. Um, of how this works. So this is Isidore Seville. Um, give you a sense of how people like Isidore tapped into a Christian cosmography. And so you see there, it is certain that the Goths are a very old nation, so they have ancient. Some conjecture from the, sim, uh, from the similarity of the last syllable, that the origin of their name comes from Magog, son of Japheth, and they um, deduce this mostly from the work of the prophet Ezekiel. Right, the whole point, this is completely a biblical reading of the origins of the Goths. Formerly, however, the learned were accustomed to call them Gite, rather than Gog and Magog. Right, again, this idea of how word point is in etymology. In the year 410, 16th year of, you know, we don't need to read, read all of it. But what's interesting here is this line here. With this event, Daniel's prophecy was thought by some to have been fulfilled. Daniel, of course, is a book in the Old Testament. And what Isidore is doing here, again, is tapping or t uh, plugging in Germanic contemporary people into a biblical narrative. Right? Now in this case, this is bad because it's actually a curse as opposed to a dominant family. And then Israel then repeats himself, the Goths are descended from Magog, the son of Japheth, uh, and are shown to have sprung from the same origin as the Scythians, uh, for whom they do not differ greatly in name. 
So again, this idea, because the names are similar, they must be the same people. Right? It's like, again, the idea of Sager. Because it sounds like it's wise, therefore it must be wise. Although by looking at some of the blank stares, that is being debated, I think, in your minds right now. Don't say you, if you agree with that, please. This is from Asser, and I'm not going to read this all out, because as you see very quickly, what's happening here is a genealogy. Right, so you have uh, King Alfred, who was the son of King Aethelwulf, son of, uh, son of Egbert, son of Elmund, son of Aetha, son of uh, Iopa, son of Inge Ingild, Ingild and In, the famous king of the West Saxons, were two brothers. Um, and all we had in his present life, in the, heaven, the heavenly lands, reign of Christ, uh, sons of Kenred, Kedwald, Kuthra, uh, sorry, Kutha, Kethwine, and a whole bunch of Kuths. Right, all the way back to, we get to Seth, the son of Noah, son of Lamech, son of Methuselah, son of Enoch, son of Jared, son of Mat uh, Matali, son of Canaan, son of Enos, son of, son of Seth, son of Adam. So guess why King Alfred is the great? Isn't everybody related to Adam? Well, yes. <laughs> right. if, if you know with the biblical, if you're living in biblical creation, then I guess technically, yes, we all we're all related. But in the context of this, more particularly, Alfred is more related because the idea here is that Asser is tying a direct line back all the way to, to Adam. Right? That idea that, you know, if, if Alfred went to the mall, you know, when, at Christmas time, you know, at Christmas time when they have, you know, people can drop your family charts. Everybody see you know, your, your family crest, you know, family crest and your, your, your name, and you have your nice little crest and all that. If Alfred went back to, you know, say went to Conestoga or Fairview Mall, um, I'm King Alfred the Great, I like my JL to you, please. There she's all the way back to Adam. Well, um, the author also takes this idea just to relate him to other famous kings, and then also a person whom the Welsh called the whole race. So, like, it's he actually stops and like makes mention that he's related to other really important. Actually, it's like a detour, right? You've got this long line of JLG. Oh, kid! But by the way, it's this big den. So off we go. A bit of a detour. So yes, but the point is, all of this serves a deliberate function. And that is, Alfred has the right to the throne. You can't beat this genealogy, right? But also, so it does all those things. But what's interesting, and it's a subtle thing, is that while on one hand, Asher does put Alfred into this Christian genealogy, right? Again, if you, go, if you read the Old Testament, you'll see this, this genealogy. It's very easy to do. All you have to do is just do the same thing. Um, so your name is Kate. Kate. So just put Kate. Just start. You know, Kate, son, or daughter of so and so. I'm oh, sorry. Colleen. Colleen. Colleen, daughter of Joan. Joan, daughter of. Don't <laughs> <laughs> no, start. Daughter, but no, the best part is then you skip a few, and then before you know it, daughter, you know, daughter, <laughs> Kate, right? You don't have to have all of it. <laughs> just skip a few. Um, but yes, that anyone can do it. Ali, daughter of. Daughter of, daughter of, daughter of, daughter of, daughter of, see what we're back to, the, the point is, you make it all up. You're like, oh my goodness, I descended from Eve. I'm a queen. Hot damn. Right? So we have this. But the other thing that Aster is doing, and I think it's a really subtle thing, it's a really kind of neat thing, is that one hand, yes, it's, it's a Christian genealogy, but the diversion, the detour, point out. Our pagan. Right. And on the same hand, not only is Alfred connected to a Christian cosmography, he's also connected to a pagan one. So Woden, for example, that name is significant because Woden is either, depending on how you want to look at it, either a great warrior or a Norse god. Right. The point is, even though, um, like, for, you know, that actually makes the point, even the pagans worshipped for a long time as a god, and it's just, you know, sort of, undermining that idea. But the fact is, may not be a god, but it's still a powerful warrior. 
Alfred is not only connected to a Christian genealogy, he's also connected to a very powerful warrior genealogy. And that's why Alfred is, is great.